All right. Well, God bless you, everybody. Good to be together. And as I said, thank you for braving the elements tonight. Uh, just by way of housekeeping, again, don't forget that you can watch any videos that you might have missed on our YouTube channel. And uh, when you visit YouTube, just search for HT Church. You can also subscribe to our audio podcast on Apple and Spotify and all those places. If you need any help uh, finding that or subscribing to the podcast, just reach out to us. You can send us uh, along a question anytime using the email address that's in the notes, and we'll do our best to respond quickly. So last time we were together, we finished Acts 4 and 5. We saw how the church was flourishing spiritually and caring for one another and uh, caring for one another's material needs as well. We got introduced to Barnabas and he's going to be a major character in the book of Acts for the next 10 or so chapters. We talked about how Satan continued to attack the church internally and externally. Uh, We saw the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira whom God judged, of course, and after that was dealt with, the church grew even more powerfully with tremendous signs and wonders through all the apostles, although maybe most centered upon Peter. And we said that this was a time when the common people highly esteemed the church. After this, the apostles were arrested, but they were miraculously released from prison. And when they were questioned by the council, the apostles said that they must obey God rather than men. And then uh, Gamaliel, you remember one of the leading council members, he advised the council to kind of be calm and wait uh, for this new movement to fizzle out. And so as the chapter closes, the apostles are, uh, despite the council's orders, they are continuing to teach and preach Jesus everywhere. They're doing it in the temple and they're doing it from house to house. So that's where we left off. And tonight we're moving into chapter 6 and just touching chapter 7 a little bit, and we are again going to see the enemy trying to weaken the church and get the church off course. There's going to be an assault now against the unity of the church in the form of grumbling and complaining. So uh, another aspect of this attack, of course, is the apostles getting bogged down administratively and getting pulled away from the ministry that they were called to. But after this is resolved, after this is dealt with, we're going to see another wave of power being released in Jerusalem. After that happens, we will see a more serious persecution beginning. We're going to be introduced to Stephen and to his ministry. And a lot of this next section is taken up with Stephen's defense in front of the council. And this defense is actually the longest speech in the book of Acts. Now, you might have heard us say before that Acts, among other things, can be viewed as a book of speeches. So um, the way that a lot of the story gets carried forward in Acts is through the means of these speeches or through defenses of the gospel or some of the mini sermons, if you will, that we've seen. And Stephen's defense is the biggest speech in the book. It takes up 52 verses, so that's quite long. And the result of Stephen's defense is that he will be martyred, and immediately following that, there is the first huge wave of persecution that comes against the church. So this persecution, and I'm just giving you the view from a high-level view here, this persecution is important for a number of reasons. For one thing, it marks a change of attitude from the religious officials. There is not going to be any more wait-and-see approach from the religious leadership. So this is really a pivotal point in the separation between Judaism and the Jesus movement, the Messianic or Nazarene movement. The second thing is that up until now, the people, the common people by and large, have been receptive to the apostles and receptive to their message, even if the leadership has not been receptive. And that seems to change here a little bit. We're not going to see any more overt references to the people of Jerusalem, you know, really welcoming the word of Jesus. And third, and this is probably the most significant, all of these events are going to cause the gospel to spread further. So uh, the main body, perhaps, of disciples are going to scatter from Jerusalem, and they're going to spread all across the region. So 
We're going to meet Philip, the evangelist, and he is soon going to take the gospel to Samaria. He's also going to preach to an Ethiopian official, and that will mark the beginning of the spread of the gospel into Africa. We also will meet Saul of Tarsus, and of course, his ministry is going to take the gospel into Asia Minor and into Europe. And Saul, or Paul, is going to end up, of course, writing uh, over a quarter of the New Testament, if we're going by a word count, and he will write almost half the books in the New Testament. So all of that's to say that chapter 6 and 7 mark a major turning point in Acts. We are going to no longer be focused mainly on what's happening in Jerusalem, and the gospel is going to spread out now to regions beyond. So let's pick up our reading uh, in Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says that, now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. All right, so none of us is professional histori- are professional historians, so we're going to have to drill into this a little bit. So as we said, uh, in addition to the attacks of hypocrisy and persecution, we have here a new form of attack, and that is the attack of disunity. How many of you know that this is something that the devil has used successfully uh, against the body of Christ on countless occasions over the centuries, an attack against the unity of the church. Uh, Years after this, 15, 20 years after this, the Apostle Paul uh, would tell the church to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We don't make make the unity in the church. Christ makes the unity uh, in the church through his Spirit, knitting us together in him. But our job is with the help of the Holy Spirit And through obeying the commands of Christ in terms of how we should treat one another, how do we deal with sin, how do we deal with offenses, and so forth, uh, we are to maintain that unity that God has created. And here was the first time that the believers faced such a challenge. This was the first potential church split. And it was a major challenge to the unity of of Jesus church. And so the way that the apostles would deal with this or would need to deal with it was going to be something very critical indeed. And we learn here that the church is already caring for the poor widows who are among the believers, who are in the congregation. Remember what we said that in the ancient world, and here Israel's no exception, the economic situation for widows could be something that was really very dire. And the way that funds were being distributed, or at least the way that people were perceiving how money or food was being distributed, it was causing a problem. It was causing murmuring or grumbling. And that's the real meaning of the word there, complaint, uh, in this version. It really means grumbling and murmuring and complaining in that sense. So, uh, you know, We are so used to complaining about this, that, and the other thing in our culture that sometimes we fail to realize that before the Lord, murmuring and grumbling and complaining and complaining against God is viewed by God as a very destructive sin. And, um, you know, it it would do us well to take note of that and just take a little inventory of ourselves, see how many times we catch ourselves murmuring, grumbling, complaining. Why do they do it like that? Why does that have to be like that? Who says that? You know, this is like, unfortunately, very natural for us as human beings. And we need the help of the spirit to come to a place of um, receiving things, receiving news, receiving people, receiving the way things that are done, the way things are done in a, in a gracious manner. So, so who are the parties here? As I said, there was the risk of a church split. And The result of this was was that it was handled very well, thank God, by the apostles. And so the people were able to sort of operate, not as a split, but sort of able to operate and appreciate each other's culture and worship together but apart in ways that did not create a split. So we have this confrontation or this 
little bit of strife between the Hebrews and the Hellenists, these two groups among the disciples. And while scholars can debate a lot of what is happening in this chapter, um, the basics, I think, we're on good ground to say that the basics are as follows here. You have one group, which is the so-called Hebrew believers. These would be the people who were more steeped in Hebrew culture. They would have had more connection to Judea there, to the land, and they probably would have spoken Aramaic as their native language. Uh, when they had religious services, their religious services would have been in Hebrew, and they would have been able to read the Hebrew Bible and Hebrew prayers and so forth. Now, this group would have included, of course, all of the original believers in Jesus, all of the people who followed Jesus around from the beginning would have been in this cultural group. And nearly, probably all 12 of Jesus' apostles, with the possible exception of Judas Iscariot, uh, would have been part of this culture. They were all Aramaic-speaking Galileans, okay? They're from the north of Israel. As we said, the Galileans were considered like country bumpkins, this kind of thing, and they were Aramaic-speaking. That doesn't mean that Peter and the others could not speak Greek, but Aramaic was their native language, their heart language. Now, I'm sure that in today's America, all of you know someone who speaks other languages than what you speak, right? And you see when a person who speaks a different language is trying to find something and they don't quite have it and they have to kind of like drop out of English and they have to find the word that they have. Like some people, uh, some people, if they're doing, you know, multiplication tables or something, they have to drop out of English and do it in their own language or whatever it is. So for these folks, Aramaic was their heart language. Doesn't mean that Peter couldn't speak and understand Greek, but he probably didn't think in Greek. He probably thought in Aramaic. And so this Hebrew group probably also would have included all the believers that they've been sort of picking up from the Jerusalem area who were also raised in and around Jerusalem in Judea. So both the Galileans and the Jerusalem area believers would have been more oriented towards Aramaic, towards using Hebrew, and they would have been more um, closely joined, more closely wedded to Hebrew culture and traditions. But then we have this other group who is the Hellenists. Now, if you like to read the old King James Bible, you will notice that the King James uses the term Grecians. And that's a little confusing because these were not Greek people, ethnically speaking. Okay, they were not Greeks, they were Jews. And so your modern translations are more likely to say Hellenists or Hellenic Jews. And that's how it reads in the Greek language of the New Testament. So, so what is a Hellenist? Uh, we get this word from a mythical ancestor of the Greeks. His name was Helen. And uh, if you know some Greek people, that we have quite a few Greek people in our area here, all around New York, you may know that Greek people in their own language, they refer to their own country as Hellas. And so a Hellenist or a Hellenic Jew was a Jew who was more immersed in Greek culture. If you Hellenized, that was a word. If you Hellenized, it means that you were adopting Greek ways and customs. So in that day, just as in modern times, lots of Jews, many Jews, millions of them lived outside of Israel. And they lived in what we called and still call to this day the diaspora, the diaspora, uh, which means the dispersion. So a lot of times, even today, you might see references to diaspora Jews. So through Jewish migration and through the conquests of Jewish land uh, in the Old Testament, whether it was conquest by the Assyrians, conquest by the Babylonians, the Jewish people had been dispersed all over the known world, both inside the Roman Empire and outside the Roman Empire. Uh, we think that maybe as much as 10% of the Roman Empire at this time were Jewish people. And in some places, in cities and some other areas, that figure would have been even higher than that. So 
I think we can get a good grasp of this if we consider our situation today. Just like English is the main international language today, Greek was the common language. It was a common language for education, uh, you name it, architecture, science, trade. It was the main language for trade in the Eastern Mediterranean world. So Jews who lived not in Israel but lived outside Israel, Jews in the diaspora, would have been much more likely to speak Greek or whatever local language was there where they were living as opposed to speaking Aramaic like they did in Israel. It's just like today, right? If you have uh, Russian Jews that come here from Russia, you know, as they were coming, lots of Jews coming here from Russia in the 80s and 90s, right? Um, they would be more likely to speak Russian or speak English now, right? But they maybe couldn't communicate with Jewish people in Israel using Hebrew. Does, does that make sense? So it's, it's a very similar kind of situation. Now, the, the crowd that we saw on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they could probably hear and understand Greek, and they knew the languages of their home region, whatever that region was, but they might not have known Aramaic or Hebrew. In fact, they might not even have read the Bible in Hebrew because a lot of people all across the Mediterranean world, they were using the Greek translation of the Bible, known as the Septuagint. So there were a lot of Jews who would read the Bible in Greek, not even reading it in Hebrew. A Jewish source uh, in the Talmud, the, the Talmud tells us that there were almost 500 synagogues in Jerusalem at this time. And just like synagogues and churches are today, all throughout history, uh, a lot of people would tend to worship with those who were of a common language, who had a common culture, right? So there were synagogues in Jerusalem for Hellenist Jews from all different places. So if you were a Jewish person from North Africa, you probably worshipped in a synagogue that was for North African Jews, right? Because you have similar language, you have similar culture, foods, all of these things, and just your way of living. So none of this should be surprising, right? If we look at more modern Jewish history, or if we look at today's American culture, there are many ethnic communities, and yet most of us, there's this common layer where most of us can make ourselves understood in English, but yet there are obviously many ethnic communities. Same thing there. The Hellenists were Jews. They worshiped the God of Israel, of course. But otherwise, when it came to culture, they might not have had very much in common at all with, uh, you know, Galilean fishermen like Peter and Andrew. They might have flowed a lot better with somebody like Barnabas. Barnabas is probably the first Hellenist Jew who is a, mentioned as a believer in the book of Acts. Barnabas, um, he's from Cyprus, and so he probably grew up speaking Greek. Whatever attachments he did have to Jerusalem, and he probably did, his culture was that he was a Cypriot Jew who probably grew up speaking Greek, not Aramaic. Now, we don't know how this squabble with, about the widows came about, but scholars suspect that the number of poor people among the Hellenists was, could be quite high compared to how many of the Hebraic Jews were poor. A lot of the Hellenists came to retire in Israel because they believed that uh, the resurrection was going to happen there. And you never know, you retire, you want to be close to God, you want to be close to the temple, and you never know, the Messiah might come. So you also want to be uh, in Israel in case the Messiah comes, because where is the Messiah coming to? He's coming to Israel. So uh, if, if there were people who had some money, had a little money, they might sell what little they had and then retire in Israel. But what happens? Over time, you know, the number of widows would increase. It's just natural, right? So men usually die younger than women. And so over time, you have this population of retiree widows. And um, at the same time, this, this makes a lot of sense, I hope, right? At the same time, where's all their family network that could help them? 
Their family is back in Greece or Cappadocia or wherever they came from before they retired to Israel. But whatever the reasons and however it was all playing out administratively, it seems to have created some inequality in how things were being handled, or at least that was the perception. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine that Peter and the rest of them were deliberately doing something, right, to, uh, you know, kind of undercut uh, these poor widows. I don't think at all that's what, what's happening here. And nobody thinks that, but, you know, sometimes there can be a perception, there can be misunderstandings because of culture and language, right? So, all right, moving on to verse 2. Luke says, then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So the apostles, thankfully, they exercised good judgment when they learned about this or when they discerned that there was a problem. They called the disciples together. I like, I like that they got ahead of this. I like that they were proactive. Um, you know, nobody knocked on Peter's door and said, hey, Peter, you really got to deal with this. No, they seem to have gotten ahead of it. So they called the disciples together. And as far as we can tell, uh, this is the only congregational meeting, if you want to call it that, so to speak, that we will see in the book of Acts. Doesn't mean that every single believer was there, but evidently it was a a good-sized gathering. And they recognize that it's not desirable or reasonable for them to be engaged in that kind of service. Now, don't get... Don't get the apostles wrong here. They were not opposed to serving other people, right? Jesus had taught them to love and serve one another, even to wash feet, which was the job of a slave. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was to make sure that they remained doing what Jesus had called them to do, using the particular gifts that he had given them and had perhaps not given to other people. So, you know, everything that we do for Jesus is serving, amen? Serving tables is serving, and ministering the word is also serving. In the Bible, it's all described by the word diakonia, which means ministry or serving. That is the word that gives us our word deacon, which just means a servant or a minister. So, for that reason, you might have heard people speaking of these seven men who were selected here as the first seven deacons, although the text doesn't use that language to describe them. And the apostles had this wise solution for the people themselves to seek out seven men. So notice there's no running for office here. There's no, you know, nobody's plastering up signs that says vote for Timon, right? That's not happening here. So the people were to select people who were already known to them as being men of high caliber, men of quality. And we notice that the ones who were selected, all of them, each one of them had a Greek name. These are all Greek names. Doesn't necessarily mean that they were all Hellenistic in their culture, but it seems likely given that none of them, not a single one of the seven, has a Hebrew name at all. Interestingly, one of them was even a proselyte, which means that he was born a Gentile and he had converted to Judaism. So he, this man, Nicholas from Antioch, he went through all of the steps that you needed to go through to become a Jew, including being circumcised. So part of the solution to making things uh, better seems to have just been letting the people choose leaders who were like them who understood them, who maybe looked like them, who could talk 
with them. The apostles, uh, interestingly, the apostles did not make any requirement that these men had to have known Jesus. Now remember, when they were place, replacing Judas Iscariot, one of the conditions was be, because of the nature of that ministry, they had to select someone who had been with them all the way from the beginning. But there's no such requirement here. And perhaps some of these men did not know Jesus in the flesh, you know, when Jesus was with them during his earthly ministry. But the qualifications that the apostles did give were very important. And I certainly recommend these qualifications to you uh, if you're picking people for anything that involves the work of God's kingdom. First, they had to be people of good reputation. Outsiders had to think well of them. Isn't that interesting? Now, you know, we know that sometimes the world is not going to like us. The world is not going to receive us. Uh, Jesus said, don't be surprised if the world hates you, right? So, but here, it's still important that the person have a good reputation in the eyes of the world. Second, you have to be full of the Holy Spirit. And that, that's very interesting to me because the apostles seem to be recognizing that although all believers have the Spirit, the Spirit's work is more evident and more powerful, it would seem, in some people's lives than others. And the apostles expected the people to be able to notice that. Who are the people that God really seems to be using? In other words, not, this is not a matter about who has the most sparkling personality, but who is a person in whom the work of the Spirit is evident. And they would also have to be men of wisdom. Now, if you really know your Bible, you, this may ring, set off an alarm bell in your mind because this is all very similar to the story of Moses. Um, when uh, Moses was overworked, you know, uh, God told Moses to choose 70 men who Moses knew were elders and officers over the people. So it's not, let's, let's have a vote, like, oh, pick me, pick me. No, that's not what's happening here. What's happening is that the people are selecting the people that they already know are the Christians of quality. So this pleased the people. And it also enabled, importantly, the apostles to keep doing what God had called them to do, which was to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, uh, which no doubt meant studying the word as well as preaching and teaching on a continual basis. So the duties of Peter and the other apostles meant that they had to stay before God in that way. The apostles are saying it wouldn't be pleasing in the sense like it wouldn't make sense almost. It wouldn't be rational for them to leave the word of God and get sidetracked by administrative duties. And I think that's what the apostles are really driving at in their statement. You know, um, we have pastors who preach the word here. Uh, you don't want your pastors, and again, it's not that there's anything wrong with this at all. We all have different ways of serving Christ, but you would not want Pastor Glenn to spend 40 hours a week filing papers in the filing cabinet. Because guess what? Your sermon is not going to be what God would want it to be on Sunday morning. And so this is the concern uh, that Peter and the other apostles have. So, so please don't take away from this the idea that the apostles thought that serving in this fashion was beneath them. And it doesn't even literally mean that Stephen's like serving plates of food, but they're managing money as well, right? This is as much of an accounting job as it is a cleanup job. But, but Peter and John and the rest of them did, did not think that. In fact, if you remember, most of these men, most of the apostles, with maybe a handful of exceptions, these were all guys who were very much accustomed to back-breaking work. So that is not at all what this is about. It's just that now their labors need to be in a different area. And so they would devote themselves to the word. And this is the same word that we saw used earlier in Acts when we saw how the church was devoting itself to the teaching, devoting itself to the breaking of the bread. It's, a, it's the same word. It has the idea that you're going to constantly be giving yourself to those things. All right, so now we're going to meet the seven themselves, and most notable among them is Stephen. 
And Luke tells us that Stephen was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. How many of you would like the Holy Spirit to record that about you in Scripture? That's awesome. That is a glowing character reference. And it is one that Luke really only applies to one other person, and that is Barnabas. Next comes Philip, um, who is later known as Philip the Evangelist. He is the only one among these men besides Stephen who's going to be prominent in the story of Acts. Uh, We should not confuse him with the Apostle Philip, who was one of the 12 apostles, original apostles. So this is a different Philip. Uh, It's been said that Stephen and Philip were used by the Lord to break the church out into its next phases so that the church would begin to, to minister to some people groups who were kind of on the edge or on the fringes of Jewish culture, of Hebrew culture. Stephen, as we'll see next week, he provided maybe more of the teaching, more of the argumentation to make that possible. But Philip is the guy who, perhaps because Stephen uh, was martyred, uh, it fell mostly to Philip to take it on the road. And so Philip was going to take the gospel to people who were not 100% Gentiles, maybe. They, they were kind of almost cousins uh, of the Jews. So the Samaritans were on the edge of Jewish culture. And it also went to Africa uh, through an Ethiopian. And the Ethiopian eunuch was probably also very connected. There were strong connections, uh, religious connections between Ethiopia and Israel, uh, throughout the period of the Old Testament, the Ethiopian eunuch, well, I don't want to get it too ahead of us, but the Ethiopian eunuch was probably uh, perhaps himself a convert to Judaism. There were many Jews to the south of Egypt, and he probably, because he was a eunuch and he had that done to his body, he could not fully enter into the worship of Judaism because being a eunuch, he could not enter into the temple of God. And yet he clearly is devoted to the God of Israel. So so here is Philip um, reaching out and bringing the gospel to people who are sort of on the fringes of Jewish culture. So all of that is the widening of the scope of the gospel. So I want to suggest, this is by no means an original idea to me, but next to Peter and Paul, Stephen and Philip are the most significant figures in the book of Acts. I would probably throw Barnabas in there also because he's so important as a supporting character throughout the book. And and I would suggest really that um, now that we've met these men, or at least mentioned them, these are really the five main characters uh, in the book. You have Peter and you have Stephen and Philip and Barnabas and Paul. Those are your main characters. Regarding the other five so-called deacons, Scripture really doesn't tell us anything about these men uh, at all. There are some early church traditions about them, that some of them were bishops or some of them were among the 70 that Jesus had sent out. We just really don't know. Uh, So the apostles lay hands on them and pray, and once they do, we see again this pattern that Luke has showed us a couple of times. Once the crisis is dealt with, once it's resolved, in a godly way, once the peace and the stability of the church has been restored again, the gospel again goes forth and spreads in a powerful way. And Luke makes this super important note for us. There's not just the addition of souls, but there is the multiplication of the church in Jerusalem. And then finally, uh, before we see Stephen's ministry, we get this extra interesting detail, uh, additional detail of many priests believing in Jesus. And this, again, is something that shows us the degree to which the faith keeps making inroads. There were thousands of priests at this time. Some of the estimates would say that throughout all the land, there's something like 18 or 20,000 of these men. And most of them are simple people. Most of them, they're, they're not wealthy They are not part of the Jerusalem elite. They are regular people. They are not, you know, connected, politically connected Sadducees. And they live in the towns and villages of Israel. They live all over the land. Most of them um, worked as tradesmen. They worked as teachers in the villages and cities of Israel because they only served at the temple four months a year. 
I'm sorry, four weeks a year in addition to the major holidays. And so they had regular lives among the people and the gospel was reaching them now as well. So now we meet Stephen uh, a, a little bit more about his ministry. We hear here starting in verse eight. Luke says that Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. I love that. I wish God would say that about me. Amen. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat at the council, looking steadfastly, saw his face as the face of an angel. Then the high priest said, are these things so? That's like a, that's a real dramatic segue, isn't it? Are these things so? So as we go forward now, through the balance of, uh, really that's just the first verse of seven. So through the balance of chapter seven, Luke obviously is focusing our attention on Stephen. We see his ministry. We, we're going to see his defense, which, as you know, is going to lead to his martyrdom. And we're not going to be able to get through that this week because we want to give it the space that and attention it deserves. Uh, there is a reason why, as we said, that it is the longest of all the speeches in Acts. And it's because it really is so important. Luke is highlighting for us how powerfully the Lord is using Stephen. He not only has said that Stephen is full of faith and power, but also that he is doing great wonders and signs. I mean, it's one thing to do wonders and signs, but Luke wants you to know that Stephen is doing great wonders and signs. Now, you might have heard me say this before, but as far as I know, this is the only person in the Bible who is said to have done great wonders and signs other than perhaps Moses and Jesus. That doesn't mean that other people were not doing great wonders and signs, okay? But it's rare for the Holy Spirit to use this kind of language. And Stephen is having disputes, uh, and this means a theological dispute, with the Jews of a particular synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the freed men. What is a freed man? A freed man was someone who had been a slave at one time, but who had been set free. Now, I think we know that slavery was a very common thing in the Roman Empire. And depending on where you were, in some places, a third or more of the population might be slaves and former slaves. Uh, there were a lot of Jewish freedmen. They were people who had been captured in uh, war with the Romans and then later released, and they became freedmen. So the people disputing with Stephen here, they seem to have come from different regions at a little bit of a remove, a little distance from Jerusalem. So um, you have Cyrene, which is a place that pops up uh, in the New Testament a few times. You remember Simon of Cyrene. He carried the cross for Jesus. So Cyrene, Cyrene Kirene is a place in North Africa. For us, that would be around Libya. Alexandria is mentioned there. That, that was the major city of Egypt uh, in this time, era of history. And this is the first time that we see a reference to the region of Cilicia, uh, it's actually pronounced Kilikia, but, you know, for whatever reason, uh, as is the case with uh, many biblical names, you will notice that the English language prefers a soft C sound, the S sound for that C, instead of the harder K sound, which is really how a lot of these things were pronounced, right? So it was, it was actually not Julius Caesar, it was Julius Caesar, Right? You remember the Germans had the Kaiser? That's literally how it was pronounced uh, in uh, Latin. So Kalikia or Cilicia is a region of the Roman Empire in what is now Turkey. And then we have Asia, which again is not what we call Asia, 
but it's another region in what we call today Turkey. And as we go through Acts, we're going to see a lot of references to Cilicia. Paul is going to engage in ministry there. And in fact, Cilicia is the homeland of Paul. Paul's home city was Tarsus, and Tarsus was located in Cilicia. And so there's a really tantalizing possibility here that this dispute um, between Stephen and this particular synagogue, Paul might have been a part of this synagogue. So this might have been Paul's first exposure to Stephen and Stephen's doctrine. Notice that they could not resist the wisdom that Stephen possessed or the spirit by which he spoke. And we, don't, we can't tell if that should be a capital S or if it should be a small s, if you follow me. Is, is, is Luke talking about the Holy Spirit or is he talking maybe about the anointing uh, that was on Stephen? It's kind of the same thing anyway, but we just don't know. But maybe you notice that just as had happened in the case of Jesus, we've got false witnesses that have been procured and that probably means paid, uh, in order to get Stephen in front of the council to eliminate him. Um, the Jewish people, of course, valued Moses so highly that, you know, just saying that a person was against Moses, I mean, that's really all you had to do to get people's attention. And the result is that Stephen was seized. Now, I don't know if you caught the detail, but you see something now that is very different. For the first time, since the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, we see the people getting stirred up and not in a positive way. Up until now, the common people have been neutral or sometimes even quite favorable towards the Jesus movement. But all of a sudden, we see the people stirred up and that is something new and ominous. So these false witnesses now are claiming that Stephen has transgressed in a few different ways. He's spoken, they say, against the holy place, the temple. He's spoken against the law of Moses itself. Um, they are maybe connecting this to the words of Jesus, saying that Jesus is going to destroy the temple and change their customs. Now, this could be an outright lie, or it could be a misunderstanding or a, a twisting of Jesus' words in order to um, make their case against Stephen. Because remember how Jesus had famously said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body, but that kind of language was very inflammatory uh, to the Jewish leadership. And everybody looking at Stephen now sees him with the face of an angel. And we don't know what that means either. Does Luke mean that he just looked very calm, very serene, um, because he was at peace? Remember Jesus had said, we've talked about it, how Jesus had said, you know, when you get dragged in front of the council, don't worry because the Holy Spirit will tell you what you need to say at that moment. So, or was there an actual manifestation of the glory of God? Was he shining um, with God's light? We just don't know. I, I do find it interesting, though, to remember that when Moses received the law, Moses himself was shining with that reflected glory. And now that they're arguing about Moses, all of a sudden Stephen looks like uh, the face uh, of an angel. I'll, I'll point out as well, you know, that the name, Stephen's name, Stephanos, means a crown. And I'm not going to say that it's foreshadowing, but, um, you know, he is about to win a crown. There's two different crowns in the Bible. There's one crown that a king wears. The crown that Jesus wears is the, the diadem crown, the diadema. That's exactly where we get our word diadem from. But the victor's crown, like when you ran a race in the Olympics and you won, they gave you the Stephanos crown. They gave you the Stephen crown to wear on your head. And so here's Jesus um, in the book of Revelation saying, be faithful to me and I will give you the crown of life. So it's interesting that Stephen, the first martyr, his very name, Stephanos, means a crown. And that's really powerful to me. So the high priest questions him as to whether these things are so. And so now, what, what are we witnessing? We are witnessing a scene that is very similar to the trial of Jesus, complete with the false witnesses, uh, similar accusations, and even the same cast of characters, okay, that, uh, who are trying him, trying him with his very life at stake. 
You have the same men, and this is maybe only a year later, a year after Jesus was crucified, and here's all the same men sitting in judgment against Stephen. So um, Acts chapter 7 is taken up, as I said, almost entirely by Stephen's offense, and I just want to lay a tiny bit of groundwork for it uh, before we close. As I mentioned, it's the longest speech in Acts, and we can say that in some ways it's the most important speech in Acts. All of the speeches in Acts are really, we could, the early church could really use them as examples, teaching examples as to what kind of content do you want to deliver to different audiences. But, but this is a speech that helps you understand the basics of the faith and how it was diverging from the Jewish conceptions of how we needed to worship God. So, as I said, there's a lot of sermons there's a lot of short presentations of the gospel that we have seen and will continue to see in Acts. But this is the speech that ends up catapulting the gospel into places that it hasn't gone before. This speech gives lengthy argumentation as to how God knew the Jewish people, how God cared for the Jews even if they did not have the Torah, even if they did not have the law of Moses, even if they did not have the temple, even if they were not in the land. The speech shows us how God is the God of all people. He's the God of all the earth, and he can be known by all people anywhere. And that is so important. It helps give a theological justification for taking the gospel to the Gentiles. It is therefore laying the, the groundwork for the ministry of Paul, taking the gospel to the Gentiles and doing it in such a way that the Gentiles do not have to become Jews first in order to become believers in Jesus. And so Stephen is going to show them all of that, not by making it up, he's going to show them that from the Hebrew scriptures, from the Old Testament. That is the importance of the speech, really. We can divide the speech into several sections. So, you know, I like to, you know, if you ever go back and you watch these on YouTube, you know, I put the timestamps in so you can go back and watch particular sections. So if you need to go back and sink your teeth again into what I just said, I'll probably have to go and watch it and sink my teeth into what I just said as well. Um, but we can divide the speech into several sections. So one section begins right at the beginning of Jewish history with the details of the story of Abraham, their ancestor. And just, just to give you a taste of what I'm talking about, he starts off the speech by saying that the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was still back in Ur of the Chaldees. So right off the bat... He's making a point. God is actually appearing to Abraham. Where is Abraham? He's not in the land. He doesn't even know God yet. And yet God's appearing to him in glory when he's outside the land and not even in covenant yet with him. So when you look at it like that, that's a very significant statement. That's just the beginning of his point that to know God, you don't have to be in Israel, you don't have to be at the temple, and you don't have to have the law of Moses because God personally appeared to Abraham, and Abraham had none of those things. Do you see what I'm getting at? And the entire speech is like that. So start with Abraham. The next section talks about Joseph, again, another of the famous patriarchs. The next section deals with Moses, and then a final section deals with the later history in the time of David and Solomon. So... Um, if we are to read the speech casually, we might not understand what the fuss was all about. Um, some people have complained because they haven't read it properly. Some people have said, you know, this is a head scratcher. What's this all about? Some people have said that this is a boring recitation about the facts of the history of Israel that everybody in the room already knew, which they did. But it would be a mistake to look at it like that. So because of the inspiration of the Spirit and because Stephen had such great knowledge of the, world, of the Word, he's able to put together these important arguments. So uh, as I mentioned, he's going to tell them how God spoke to them, how God was with them even before they were in the land, and even when in later times they were outside of the land. 
God rescued them out of Egypt. God appeared personally in Egypt, right, to rescue them. He called them when they were outside the land, and he intervened on their behalf when they were outside the land. So Stephen's going to prove to them that God's relationship with them was not about the land or the law per se, but it was just because God loved them, he chose them, and he revealed himself to them. He's also going to show them how many times they had disobeyed God, missed God, or delayed in obeying God. And the messengers that God sent to them, such as Moses and the prophets, they rejected and refused. And so Stephen's implying to them that the case of Jesus is just another case like that. You rejected Moses, you rejected all the prophets and killed them, you did the same thing here. And he's going to show them that God doesn't need a temple. And he's not going to say, oh, this is a Christian idea I made up because there's no such thing yet, right? <laughs> there are no Christians at this time. He's going to show them from their own scriptures that God doesn't need a temple and that God, of course, cannot be confined to a temple because he made everything. So how can he be confined to a house made out of elements that he spoke into being? In addition to that, we know that Jesus said a time was coming when people would not worship just in Jerusalem, but that God was going to be personally available to people anywhere at any time that they would worship him in spirit and in truth. So Stephen, it seems, understood that that time had come. And in his mind and in his teaching, he was now taking it farther than Peter and the rest of the apostles had taken it. Stephen was seeing the bigger, fuller implications of what had really happened through Jesus. So hearing all of this and then hearing Stephen rebuke them and tell them that they were disobedient to God, that, of course, is going to enrage the council and it results in Stephen's death. Uh, it's been often said God uh, got a martyr, but then the church got an apostle because uh, that was one of the things that no doubt induced Paul to come to faith and it bothered his conscience conscience so much, right, that when Jesus appears to Paul on the road to Damascus, he says, it's hard for you, Saul, to kick against, against the goads, against the prods. So that's where we're going to pick up things next time, and we will look at Stephen's defense in a little more detail, and uh, we will meet Saul of Tarsus, and uh, if we have time, we will see how the gospel then uh, begins to spread outward from Judea. So uh, for next time, read chapter 7 and read chapter 8. And just with me giving you that couple of minutes of introduction, see now if you can follow the thread of the points, right? See if you can follow the points that Stephen is making. Because I, I know that a lot of people, when they read Stephen's defense, they just kind of zip through it. What's the point? He's just telling them stuff they already know. Now that I share that with you, Go read Ch Acts chapter 7 again and notice everything that Stephen is saying to them and how skillfully he has put that together because it's just is a marvelous presentation. So, all right, so that's what I have to share with you. And uh, I'll take a couple of quick questions. I did want to leave time for us to be able to pray, but uh, we'll take one or two quick questions. Brother Frank. Well, I don't see any other hands yet, so we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think this comes in a little bit later, but the, um, the, they're talking about the Greeks. They were very religious. Uh, I think it's in Paul's writings. But they had a pagan god on every corner. I don't, I don't understand what you're there was a, the, the, the Greeks, they were religious, but didn't, in, in later writings, he said something about they were very religious, but they had pagan gods. They'd, you know, God for everything. Yeah, that was the Greeks, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When Paul is um, when Paul is taking the gospel to Athens, right. yeah. so that's chapter like seventeen. So yeah, that's not anything to do with the Hellenists because those are Jews of Greek culture. So they're Jews. They worship the God of Israel, but they have Greek culture, right? They're not to be confused with the Greeks themselves, the ethnic Greeks who are pagans. Yeah, but they were living in a community of pagans. Sure, right. just, just like if right. from, the the Jewish, they, from the Jewish perspective today, right? right? If, I mean, if you're an Orthodox Jew living in Brooklyn, you're seeing the world the same way. 
right? That I'm living in this sea of, of Gentiles, of Goyim, and I'm worshiping the God of Israel. So same, same idea, yeah. Michael. Thank you. Um, on the first five chapters of Acts, my, my, my question is um, Roman rule. Did they have laws over the uh, disciples? Uh, or or did they, how, how much tolerance did they have? I know unless there was a riot or whatever, they put maybe Peter in jail or something like that. How much tolerance did they have for the disciples to preach the word of God? What was their law about it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the Romans... Uh, the Romans did not level everything in that sense. It was more of a real empire. So compared to something like Islam, if Islam comes in and historically takes over your country, right, now all of a sudden they, they could wipe everything out. No, you all have to become Muslims. We don't allow this. We don't allow that. It's a, it's a very different... Uh, vibe, we could say. So if the, the Romans uh, would take over and they would, in many cases, allow the civil life and the religion of the people to just keep going. In fact, they were probably more lenient with the Jews than they were with most other people. Because the Jewish people, they um, sort of held exempt from uh, many of the things that were imposed on, on other people. And they just tolerated them. So but I mean, it, it just depended on where you were. Just depended on where you were. Uh, obviously, there were offenses against Rome. Um, at some point, while Jesus was during around the time Jesus of Jesus' childhood, the Romans took away from the Jews uh, the right of capital punishment, and that comes that, that plays out in the Gospels. That's why they need to bring him to, um, in their minds, to make it legit. They have to bring him to Pilate. Remember, because they said it's, it's not lawful for us to put any man to death. Um, but the Romans allowed the Jewish leaders to sort of police their own religion, police the temple area, things like that. So they had limited jurisdiction, we, we would say in our terms, to, to manage some of their local affairs. Um, you know, if things got out of hand uh, from the Romans' perspective, they could always clamp down, declare martial law, whatever, whatever they needed to do. But, you know, the thing about an empire is you, you want to make this fiction that says, oh, we're all one big happy empire together. United for the glory of Rome and the, the Gauls and the Italians and the Syrians and the Egyptians and the Jews were one big happy Roman Empire family. Um, you know, you can worship whatever gods you want, but just make sure that you honor the divinity of Caesar also, th this type of thing. So, so there was um, an attempt to have some, some unity there as opposed to the more leveling type of, of, of um, uh, approach, let's say, that, that at times in history Islam has had where they just, where they wipe you out, where there's no remaining trace, Right? I mean, if you go to Egypt today, there's probably 10% Christian and everything else is Muslim. It's totally the opposite because those were Christian lands, but they came in and completely transformed and, and even, uh, as they would say, Arabized the culture. So the, the native languages even of all those places is wiped out in favor of Arabic. So it, it's just a very different uh, approach to it. So yeah, but that's, that's a great question. Anybody else uh, question? Ms. Elizabeth, I see you back there. That's all right, I need my steps. Um, I'm not sure that this is really a question. I think it's more of, of a, an observation and also sort of kind of a question. <laughs> because when I have read the book of Acts and now that we are going through it together, I just cannot, um, I am puzzled by the power of God that was so evident in the book of Acts. And as you are breaking it down, I'm now realizing that it was a time of revival for 
that time, and they were able to see the power of God in such a great, mighty way, which we desire to see today. Now, tonight, as you talked about the, the unity, and actually you said that when the crisis was resolved, the gospel spread in powerful way, and there was multiplication. So I cannot help but wonder whether as we pray for us to see the power of God in this great length, is kind of God waiting for us as a church to get our acts together in terms of some of these basic things that we still have not figured out how to manage as a people, as human beings who are always striving and, and, and just operating in our own way, that's, that's just one, I guess that's the question part. And then I also cannot begin to, I, I also wonder what else would God want us to, to do in order for us to actually see the, you know, the power and the, the power of the Holy Spirit that was just evident. So just, please. Okay. No, that's all good. That's all real good. So um, there's always been, for the past few centuries, there's been a very big debate always in church circles about revival and how it comes. Um, where does it come from? Is it, is it something that is completely sovereign that God's going to do whenever God wants to do it? Uh, or is it something that, because God can send his power at any time, right? Or is it something that we um, produce, if you will. So there have been some well-known revivalists uh, of the past who would say that there's nothing really supernatural about a revival per se. It's, it comes like a crop. It's as natural as sowing seed and reaping a crop. And if you do uh, what you're supposed to do, you will reap a move of the spirit like that. So um, I, I would think that maybe it's a little more cooperative with that, uh, you know, in terms of our cooperating with God. But I, I do notice, I think somebody asked a similar question a week or two ago, but um, I, I do notice that whenever these great revivals in history have broken out, they are usually preceded by the confession of sin. I think that's a very clear historic pattern. And there are many times when people have had meetings in which they were confessing sin that then the Holy Spirit came in and began to move in, in great power and, and then the life of that church and even the community was, was greatly affected. Um, I think most of the problem, right, well, the, the problem is never on God's end. The problem is on, is on our end. And we are so accustomed, um, I, I said it, I think, in the fall, maybe, in the healing course we were doing, like, um, that we cannot accept the normality of powerlessness. So part of it is that we, we cannot be content not to have the power of God at work. But the church is so divided across the world that Christians will be arguing amongst their various denominations as to what that even means. What does that mean? What does the power of God look like? What, what gifts and what practices are for today? And what gifts and practices have passed away? And we shouldn't seek them, right? It's like, oh, yes, let's speak in tongues. No, don't speak with tongues. Then there's other churches like, don't seek, but don't forbid. <laughs> right? So how are we going to arrive at a place where we're going to see that power in any more than just pockets? Right? Maybe we will see that power, but it's not going to be widespread. Now, this is, this is a non-repeatable event in that it's the beginning of the church. And so, you know, on the day of Pentecost, those 120 people are pretty much all the Christians there are in the whole planet. So, um, so we have to be careful not to idealize that 
too much and you know think that we are going to arrive at something like that. On the other hand, we have to have faith that God can work to bring us to a much higher level that would be more pleasing to him because without faith it's impossible to please God. Now, some of you maybe are not this old, but when we had the uh, when we had the charismatic movement, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you had a lot of people from denominations who ordinarily didn't connect, right? working and worshiping together because they had, through the work of the Holy Spirit, they had found this new commonality in Christ that they didn't have before or that they were not aware of before. And so they were able to flow together and worship together despite their denominational labels. And I think the deeper we go into the end of the age, I think that's where God has to bring us, you know, where we have to you unite around the essentials in Christ and then we, we can seek that the power. And, you know, um, because I think, I think where we're heading in this country and all around the world, we're, we're going to all walk, have to walk with such a sense of the Spirit's nearness and a sense of his daily direction. This is kind of what I was talking about at the, at the Saturday seminar. We're going to have to have that relationship like Philip had, that he could hear the Holy Spirit say, hey, go pull up alongside this chariot. We're going to have to hear, know and hear the voice of Jesus, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us in our daily lives, or else we're just not going to make it. I mean, I hate to be so dramatic about it, but, but that, that is the reality. In order to fulfill what God is putting into each one of our hands, we're going to have to know him and, and obey the commands of Christ at a higher level than we are accustomed to doing and not be satisfied with the level to which we have attained. And then we will see more. And yes, they have, you know, to I guess to the your original the beginning of your question, yes, we have to specifically pray for the power. We see in the Acts 4 uh, prayer meeting that they are deliberately, very deliberately, very specifically praying for God to stretch forth his hand to heal and do signs and wonders through them. And we need to do the same or else I think in large measure we are just simply not going to see it. And I, and I don't think, I don't think that's, that's pleasing to God. I don't think that um, the Christian life was designed to be a mere intellectual exercise. I mean, I love to study my Bible, love to read my Bible every day, I love to learn amazing things about the Word, but, but am I learning Christ and am I growing in fellowship with Him? Our faith is not uh, a matter of talk, the Bible says, but it's a matter of power. So if, if I am lacking in power, if I'm lacking in faith, if I'm lacking in a sense of my own nearness to Christ, I'm the only one who can resolve that by, by doing what he says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. That's, that's incumbent upon me to do. If I feel, you know, the old bumper sticker says, you know, if, if God's far from you, who moved? Right? It's, it's never God. And if he does withdraw the sense of his presence from us, it's so that we will seek after him, so that we'll pursue him once again. So, um, so yes, let's pray for power. Let's walk in such a way that, that we have a clean conscience before God. When Paul's on trial, one of Paul's many interrogations, he says, I have striven to have a clean conscience before God and man my entire life. And that's, that's, how, we have to, that's how we have to live. When we sin, we quickly confess it, quickly get rid of it, quickly get cleansed, and we just put that behind us and we move on, but we keep seeking him for more of his his love and power, and then we will start to see more, more of these things. I notice that whenever we pray for it, preach it, model it, study it, we see more of it, right? I mean, when we had the healing, this is not the same type of a class, but in the fall, if you were with us, right? When we had the healing class, we had a lot of nights we were getting, people were having instantaneous healings. So we know that God has this grace available for us if, if we call upon him for it, so... Or you squeezed a lot more out of me than I knew I had left there in me. But uh, so, yeah. And we'll, we'll close it here, sir. Yes. Uh, from my experience, I have seen these periods where we come together and we forget our religious differences and as revivals. 
when the war ends. Yeah, where we have to we have to have a common vision. Our common vision has to be has to be Christ, and bringing Him glory. So, so, all right. Well, let's just let's just close with a word of prayer. We'll we'll let you go in consideration of the the clock and the weather. So, Lord, thank you for your word, God. We pray that you would make us like Stephen, Lord. That that the testimony of the Holy Spirit concerning us would be that we are full of faith full of power, Lord, that we would be um, of good character, that we would be full of the Holy Spirit, and that we would be full of wisdom. Lord Jesus, we need these things from you. Help us to reach our generation, Lord. Let it be said of us that people are not able to resist the wisdom and the anointing by which we are speaking, Lord. Help us to walk in the footsteps of Stephen and these other great men and women who modeled such a beautiful walk of closeness with you. So, Lord, just get us home safe and everyone who's in the building tonight, bless and seal all the good ministry that's been happening all across the building. Bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.